Hi, welcome to Infusion Health, the podcast. I'm comedian Chris Patrick, a.k.a. Self-Proclaimed Power Man. And I'm here with my co-host and significant other, Rach. Hey, guys. Now, today we have an uh, interesting show. We got, uh, his name is Carl Backstrand, and he's written over 27 books, most of them children's books, but his latest book, um, Abundance Pass, he's written about how to make same-sex relationships work. Now, I'm not... Uh, <laughs> well, we'll get into it. We'll, 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 we'll get into it. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think it's kind of the same thing of how to make any relationship work. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But let's let's bring him in okay. and we can talk about it. All right. Okay, Carl, welcome to the show. Hello. Thanks, Chris and Ray. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So you've written uh, 27 books, um, mostly children's books from what I understand. What, um, what kind of subjects do you deal with in children's books? Oh, uh, I have bilingual Spanish English books with pronunciation guide. I have STEM books for kids. I have short stories, um, career books. So quite a mix. Okay. Now, your now your latest book, um, how to make uh, same sex relationships work. Um, what what inspired you to do that? What what um what what got you into that art? <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's a book I never planned on writing, but I had a friend, um, I was telling a friend about what I'd learned um, in the last several years um, that just seemed so revolutionary and so different from what I'd believed growing up. Um, the friend said, you've got you to write this down. You've got to share this information. What's that? Hello? So, yeah. <laughs> so the book um, is basically what I've learned in, my, in the course of my life. Okay. Um, I was I was exposed to uh, sexual activity at the age of eight by a male peer, and was sexually active um, on and off into adulthood, and then was just totally out of control as a young adult. Just oh. um, could not stop being sexual with men. Okay. And um, and always had this deep yearning, this this hunger that was never being fulfilled. It was it was in deep desire for connection and never, never experienced it in the, all the years that I was a crazy <laughs> sex addict, mm-hmm. you know, even when I was, you know, even when I was in love or even when I was trying to make a relationship work or last, mm-hmm. it just seemed to fizzle. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then I finally achieved sobriety and went to the other extreme and was a recluse, almost a hermit, um, because I did not want to go back to, to being out of control. It's kind of, terrifying to, to be out of control so uh-huh. for about 10 years i was just not very social and then i felt like actually i felt like it was god that was saying get out and interact with people even men mm-hmm. and i was like hello remember me the sex addict <laughs> right yeah and it was it was frightening but um yeah about five years ago i um started to get out and, and meet men with the intent of relating in non-sexual ways mm-hmm. And the, the amazing thing that happened, it happened almost instantly in the very first interaction with another guy that understood what I was trying to do, uh-huh. um, was that because sex was off the table, immediately there was a, a deep connection, a really profound connection. And I still love this man to this day. Uh-huh. And, and that's the other thing that happened. It was, not only was it the deep connection that I'd always yearned for, but it was something that lasted. Mm-hmm. Now, quick question: so, In those mm-hmm. past relationships, were they all guys? Were they girls? Or you would just generally sexually active with both? So I'm bisexual. I'm attracted to both. I was dating women all the time that I was a, a crazy sex fiend with men. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, yeah, it's kind of a unique story because I'm not one of those people who is only attracted to one sex, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so the book talks about fluidity and um, and the different kinds of relationships. I believe there are infinite kinds of relationships and ways of relating with people. Mm-hmm. And so often we get bogged down into this paradigm of, well, it has to look like this. Otherwise, it's not legitimate or whatever. Well, <laughs> but, I think the old really, school thinking is that, you know, you're you're married. That's your everything. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't have friends. You don't talk to anybody. You talk to your spouse about everything. And for me, when I'm ticked off at Chris, I don't want to talk to him. 
<laughs> I'm calling my girlfriends and saying, look at what this man did, you know, and I'm about to go on a trip with one of my girlfriends. So yeah, I, see, I think women get this a lot better than men do. Women understand the need for girlfriends, mm -hmm. but guys, you know, guys get into a relationship and they think, okay, this partner is my world now and I can't have any other social interaction and that's totally unhealthy. Yeah, well, um, well, 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 like with 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 our relationship, um, one of the things about me is uh, <laughs> um, I wasn't um, I, I didn't have a lot of girlfriends growing up, you know, um, you know, it's kind of kind of a stocky kid and all that it hadn't worked out. But then when I got in, you know, when I got into shape, got it, you know, I found that women started but started to look at me different. But my mm -hmm. thing is, too, um, basically what I'm trying to get at is. I had a lot of alone time, you know, by myself and um, being able to uh, do things by yourself, go to movies by yourself, go to concerts by yourself. I remember one time I went and saw a Bruce Springsteen concert. My friends were like, you're going to a concert by yourself? I'm like, yeah, well, nobody likes nobody. Nobody of my friends likes Bruce. So I'm going by myself. I'm going to see the show. But there are times, too, with Rachel where it's just like, I just... I just want to be by myself right now, you know. You recently went to a Kiss concert by yourself because I had no interest in it. Well, that that was a few years ago. That was a few years ago. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. And I, well, I think that's totally healthy. I think a lot of people never get to a place where they're comfortable by themselves. Yeah. So it's good that you have that experience. Yeah, and and that's my thing too. Like like within with within your book, you know how to make same sex relations. Um, I used to work out. I used to work out at this club, and there was a guy there, an Asian guy there, and. You know, we were talking, we were talking about, you know, different music he likes. And he, you know, um, he likes certain, you know, like, you know, Janet Jackson, Madonna and all this. And I said, oh, you know, I came in, what'd you do this weekend? And he went to this club, which is a gay club here in Minneapolis. And he's like, I got to tell you something. I, think, I, got, I think I know what you're trying to say. He goes, what? I go, you're gay. He's like, well, how'd you know? I go, well, you tattooed Madonna on your arm. But in talking to him and talking to him about his relationships, I was just like, man. They want the same thing we want. You want somebody you can be with. You want somebody, you know, you want your soulmate. You want somebody you can. And it's it's kind of the same thing with with straight or gay relationships, I think. But um, correct me if I'm wrong. Well, yeah, I think um, I think all relationships are different. For example, like a parent child relationship is different from a friendship or different from a sibling relationship or a partner relationship. So there are lots of different kinds of relationships when you're relating. And sometimes. Um, we get confused and um, <laughs> we get confused about how to best relate. And um, that's where I was for, for years and years. Mm -hmm. is that I thought that, that a relationship with a guy would look a certain way. And then I found it's, it's actually better if I try it another way. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, I talked about this first guy that I connected with, had this deep bond with. It happened with the second guy that I connected with. And then a few weeks later, a third guy. And so I went to a friend and I said, I think I'm an, a freak because I'm in love with three guys. Uh -huh. and, and my friend said, you're not a freak. He said, listen, do you get jealous when they hold someone else's hand or hug someone? I said, no. He says, you have learned how the male heart works towards men. And men love men plural. Uh -huh. And um, that was just, well, a, a huge bomb in my brain is like, oh my gosh, I'm not a freak. This is just how men love each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And even straight guys that I've talked to, if they're honest, will acknowledge, you know, they have, they love their wife or their girlfriend just madly, but they also love their buddies in a especially deep and poignant way. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I understand, you know, like, you know, deep, deep friendship, uh, deep friendship with, with your friend, with, with your male friends, you know, like hanging out and stuff like that. Like people, um, people say to me, you know, well, I've said to people, you know, it's like, there's some things I like to do with guys that I don't like to do with, you know, with girls, you know, like sometimes I like, um, going to like a baseball game or a sporting event with guys. Cause that way I can act crazy. I could just be myself and, you know, <laughs> as opposed to being with the girl, like sit out and you're, you're embarrassing. You know, I could just let loose, you know? But then there's sometimes, yeah. sometimes with girls, I'd, I'd like to be with, you know, a girl or something like that instead of, instead of being with, being with a male friend. Yeah. Cause it's different energy, different, all these different relationships and different kinds of relating all contribute to our, to our health. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and I may eventually, you know, move in with a guy, but it'll have to be someone who understands that he's not going to be my world. Right. Mm -hmm. You know? 
And like, how like do you, you said, have that conversation with somebody else saying, you know what, I love you, but don't get jealous? Yeah. Um, the way I talk about it with other gay men is um, that we are conditioned while we're growing up to expect our relationship to look a certain way, the partner relationship at least. And we actually are, are programmed to hurt ourselves if our partner looks at someone else. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's ridiculous. Right. Um, and, and you, Rach, ex- expressed it well, how, you, how it's very important that you get out with a girl, or get out with a girlfriend. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a different emotional need that you have that Chris can't feel. Right. Can't feel. And so, um, yeah, it, it, so often the world tells straight to end gays that your partner has to be your world and there's nobody else, and that's just wrong. It's mm-hmm. unhealthy. And I'm not talking about sexually. I'm not saying about sleeping around. I'm just mm-hmm. saying you have different yeah. different kinds of relationships. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And, and that- I think even myself, when I was growing up, um, I, I just thought my parents were each other's old world. I didn't see their friends very often. Um, yeah. My mother related all her in- insecurities and all that on me. I was the oldest. And mm-hmm. I kind of carried that on. And I'm like, I'm not going to give that to my kids, but how do I not portray jealousy to my significant other? Because I can say in my first relationship, when I started dating him, Mm. I was very jealous. We had a long distance relationship and every single time I was jealous. And and Chris, when we started dating, had a three year long distance relationship and I'm older, much more mature at this age. Never once got jealous. Yeah. So you guys have had a maturity to your relationship. Well, I found that. And for me, go ahead, go ahead, keep hmm? go ahead, go ahead. Oh, just, for me, the advantage of not being sexual anymore with men is whoever I end up living with is going to know that I'm not sleeping around, mm-hmm. that I'm meeting friendship needs, and um, and there's just, I mean, if they get that, then there's just not going to be any jealousy, and you know, and I would have my friends over. It's not like I would do things exclusively or, you know, away from my partner necessarily. But, um, but like you said, Chris, sometimes you just need to be alone and that's important too, mm-hmm. to be alone. <laughs> mm-hmm. well, well, that's the thing too. When, when me and Rachel first started, first started dating, I, you know, um, I've seen with a lot of my other friends um, where they, they call this love, you know, where they're like, um, who are you, who are you looking at? You know, and, and this is with men and women, you know, um, who are you looking at? Who are you talking to? Um, I need to log into your, I, I need your login password to your email. I need your login password to your Facebook or your social media. TikTok account. Wow. Yeah. I need, <laughs> I need all that. It's like, well, what do you need that for? Well, if you, well, if you're not cheating on me, then, then you have nothing to hide. It's like, well, that's my own personal business. You can't get in that. And I told Rachel when we started dating, I said, if you find another guy you want to be with that treats you better than I go, go with him, go yeah. with him. But that's going to cost a relationship with me. If you care about the relationship, you won't play around, you know. And and that's yeah. that's kind of our understanding. And we haven't cheated on each other. Awesome. Yeah, a lot of a lot of people in my situation. Um, often, guys will mistake sexual euphoria for love, mm-hmm. and because because the nature of sexual euphoria is temporary, you're almost guaranteeing that you're going to fall out of love very soon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's why so often gay guys are just going from boyfriend to boyfriend to boyfriend. But um, this is just like this treasure that I found. By taking sex off the table, I found this deeper, deeper union in, in the reaching of someone. And it doesn't fade away like sexual euphoria does. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, that, well, that's the thing, too, because like like I said, I see with friends where they want they want the login to your Facebook. They want your password and all that. And they want to know who you who. You, Who's, who's this guy you're talking to? Who's this guy you're having lunch with? Well, that's a colleague I work with. And it's like, well, man, I really love this girl. I'm like, dude, uh, that's not love. That's control. You're trying to control her. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you can't you yeah. can't control her like that, yeah. you know? Being yeah. following her around and checking everything she's doing and being like that that's not love. <laughs> that's that's like obsession, you know. Yeah, that's a red flag to run away from that person. Actually, um, Funny thing with me and Chris, I he leaves his Facebook open like on our computer all the time. I could care less who's on it. And right. um, lately he's been putting posts on Facebook and I haven't been paying any attention to Facebook. And he's like, you didn't see my posts that I put up like a week ago? I'm like, 
Okay. Because <laughs> it's, it's, ba- it's basically food, po- food posts, stuff I've Right, cooked. right. But, you know, some women would get jealous. Oh, my God. It, who did you take that picture by the Ferris wheel with? And you'd be yeah. like, chill out. It was my cousin. <laughs> you know? Like, yeah. Well, that's another paradox. You, it, on, on the surface, it looks like love when someone is always looking at what you're doing. But really, a mature love is. It's like, oh, yeah, sorry, I missed that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not obsessed with you. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, like a lot, a lot of a lot of people like when um, when I talk to guys about, you know, um, meeting women and stuff like that, you know, it's like, mm-hmm. first of all, you got you, you got to put the jealousy thing aside. You know, you can't like I said, you can't be looking at her phone and going through her phone and finding what guys what male friend she has on her Facebook or social media. And vice versa. Yeah. You, you, and vice versa. You can't, you can't be doing that, you know, because you, you're, you're being obsessed. And when you're being obsessed, you're, you're basically smothering her. And some, some guys are like that, you know, um, following, yeah. following she's at the club with her girlfriends. They come in the club, come on, you got to go home. And so it's like that, that's control. You know, yeah. there, there's a difference yeah. between love and control. Yeah, uh, what's that quote? If you love something, set it free. If it comes back to you, afraid. If it doesn't, it was never yours in yeah. the first yeah. place. It was never yours to begin with. But um, yeah. but one 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 of the things I want to talk about is like it. It sounds a lot with with your life and the, being with the different guys and stuff like that. Um, there was there was one famous guy. Um, and he kind of went through the same thing, and um, I think that's what ended up uh, killing him in the end was Robert Reed. Now, if you don't know who, Robert, oh yeah, if you don't know who, Robert yeah, I do. Reed, Okay. Um, well, to the listeners out there, Robert Reed was the father of um, on the Brady Bunch, and um, nobody knew that he was gay. But after he died, all the papers went that oh, he was actually he actually had a daughter, but he was actually a gay man. And the thing right. is, from what I, from from the the documentaries and stuff I've seen on this, um, Sherwin Shorts, the guy who created the Brady Bunch, said that he he never had one person he was with. He was always with a bunch of different guys and stuff like that. Yeah, and I don't. I, well, correct me if I'm wrong. Was he? Was he just not? Was there something with him that he just couldn't find the right person? Was he searching for the right person? Was he? You know. Yeah, he's like an archetype of the average, the typical gay guy. I mean, I, I know there are gays that aren't this way, but so many are. Where it's um, like me, want, they want the deep connection, and they don't experience it in the, the normal way, the quote unquote normal way of relating between gay men, and so they move on to the next one move on to the next one because like i said the nature of sexual euphoria is temporary Mm -hmm. it just fades Mm -hmm. and so if you think that's love you're always going to be looking for that you're always going to be trying to find a new fix a new new source of that Mm -hmm. well correct me if i'm wrong i mean when we're born we start Mm -hmm. learning how relationships work from our own parents first then we look outside And then we, you know, and when we have parents that are toxic, we're not learning the healthy relationship. When we learn parent have parents that not are not healthy single. There's healthy single mm-hmm. and there's non healthy single. Yeah. And yep. when we learn that from our fa- our parents, that's our first interaction of how relationships work. Yeah. Yeah, and there's a lot of us that uh, I took 50 years to figure out who I am, what I want, and how to get it. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's part of life is just figuring out who we are and, and how to relate in the optimal way. Well, that's interesting you say that because I've I've had I've had male friends where it's like they're with one girl and then they break up and then two weeks later it's like oh who's that oh that's my girlfriend so and so then you see them you know they break up with that girl who's that oh that's my girlfriend it's like you know you. Yeah. It, it, it it's kind of like we had some some guys and some women have this thing where I gotta have a boyfriend, I gotta have a girlfriend, I got you know, and they keep getting right. it's like. And sometimes I've even said that word. You know what? You need to take some time alone and figure out who you are, what you want. Even if you got to write it down, figure out what who you are, what you want, and then go accordingly. You know. Be- I think you're so right on that, Chris, because I think in between, um, especially really long relationships, you're adjusting mm-hmm. yourself in that. So you need to spend time alone to readjust yourself and find out what you really like. Yeah. Yeah. The, the kind of person who can't stand to be alone always has to have someone with them. Yeah. Is delaying, is putting off the development that we all need. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and that's and that's the thing too, is because it's like you know, like, um, you know, some girls like I gotta have a boyfriend, or I gotta have a girlfriend, you know, or, or I gotta have a boyfriend, I gotta have a girlfriend, I got, you know, it's like, well, what what exactly? I have are you to looking have somebody for? on my side. What exactly are you <laughs> yes. looking for? And then we go to an to another way where you know, um, this girl slashed the tires on my car. This this girl um broke the windows <laughs> on my car. This this girl set my house on fire. It's like, well, maybe you need to look at some of the girls you're you're attracting, you know. And take some time yeah. to heal yourself from all that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. If you're relying on someone else to to give you give you worth, mm-hmm. that doesn't, doesn't mean anything yeah. because alone you need to have worth in yourself. Mm-hmm. But what? But what does that come from? Where where somebody where a guy or girl are looking for some looking for that other person to to, to give them that to give them that self worth? Is that from growing up? Is that from? Yeah, it could be a lot of different things. Um, yeah, if they were made to feel um, like they were of no use or value in the home, and then they find someone who, who seems to value them, and then, and then that feels great, but that's not really the source. That other person isn't really the source of their value. Mm-hmm. They need to be able to see that themselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And when... Um... So, so what is what? What would you suggest for somebody like that? To, for somebody like that to um to take to take some time to their self or trying to figure out their self, professional help or yeah, all of I the would, above. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. I mean, and and maybe go on a break from from being in relationships. If you're a serial dater, you know, maybe go on a break. And um, yeah, it can be terribly awkward and lonely at first. But you need that alone time to figure out who you are, understand that you do have worth regardless of anyone else on the planet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, what well, what about, we haven't talked about this, what about people who, and, and I'm not talking um, people that are asexual, I'm talking to people who are, who are straight and who are gay, who just like, I'm just not dating anybody right now. You know, I'm just, I'm focusing on this. I'm working on my career. I'm just, I, I, I'm just not trying to have a relationship right now. What about those people? I think that's healthy. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's good. Unless that's your pattern for like 30 years, you know, then you're, yeah. you're avoiding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Absolutely. So you've written 26 other books besides this one. Were you always mm-hmm. into school? Were you always like, yes, this is what I want to do. This is my path. Yeah, it's funny. As a kid, I didn't like to read or write. Mm-hmm. But um, I, I got the measles when I was like eight or nine, and my grandmother bought me a, a chapter book called Bicycles and Oracle Mystery. And I was totally transported. And I was like, okay, books can be fun. <laughs> but then I was like, textbooks boring, you know. Mm-hmm. But, um, but yeah, in college, I, I took uh, journalism from my undergraduate degree because it was short, mm-hmm. not because I wanted to be a reporter. But then I really loved learning how to write. Mm-hmm. And then I started getting bombarded with story ideas. And yeah, ever since, I mean, I just have a, a <laughs> stack of story ideas I'll never even get to because there's so many. That's kind of like Prince how he was, though, having bolts and bolts of music that he wrote. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, well, it's, yeah. I talk to other writers, and when they talk about writer's block, I just can't identify it. I've never been in a place where I don't have anything to write. <laughs> That's truly a blessing. Well, that was that was one of the things I saw. I saw a documentary on Woody Allen, and um, one of the ways that he he does is like once he completes a movie, he's already at the typewriter writing another one. He just he just keeps moving like that. Yeah. Yeah. Some of us, it's it's a blessing and a curse because you're like pounded by it. like the ideas will jump me they'll attack me ambush me mm-hmm. but um it's nice it's nice to have a purpose yeah well well like i'm not i'm not a writer but when i was when i was doing stand-up you know sometimes i couldn't think of anything funny and i went mm-hmm. through, i went through those times of blocks and what i found out is that just if i see something kind of remotely funny write it down write it down and then i yeah. just had to had to focus my mind on other things, watch, you know, watching TV and going out and playing golf or going, and then all of a sudden, you know, all of a sudden I'd get this, get these writing spurts where I start writing this down. I start writing this down. I started writing this down. And I learned that yeah. to take advantage, take advantage of these spurts, because when you get all these ideals coming up, boom, 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 when you do get writer's block, you can always go back to this and go, okay, well, Hey, if I change this and change this, could I work it like this and work it like that? Yep. I'm just like you. I'm constantly writing things down. 
things that inspire me. Yeah. <laughs> Cause that, that was one of the things with the rage. Cause she's like, you got a pen here. You got, and she goes, you always have a pen. I said, yeah, it's, it's from the, com- it's from my comedy days, you know, cause in case you had see something funny, you can write it down, you know? Yeah. I think that makes you a, a very uh, productive person. I would guess you're a productive person. I, I try to be. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I'm telling you, Carl, this is like a rare occurrence that I can actually nail him down for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's me. I'm always walking around with a pencil or a pen. Yeah, I, I always have a pen on me just because I was like, yeah, because like I said, back in the comedy days, you see something funny or you see a line or say, well, hey, that would be funny. Let me write this down. Let me write this down. Yeah. In fact, last night I was digging through his pockets. He's like, what are you doing to me? I'm like, I know you have a pen. <laughs> <laughs> yep. That's funny. Yeah. But it's, got, it's gotten to the point to where it's like when I don't have a pen, I'm like, where's my pen? I need a pen. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I just thought of something that I should let your listeners know they're probably curious about because many people ask me this, and that is, what about your sex drive? You know, because I'm not being sexual with guys anymore. And it's amazing. I, I think my libido is like 99% emotional mm. because I found that when my emotional needs are met, that my libido is very calm. Mm. That actually makes sense. Yeah, it's not just like the, because a lot yeah, of I people can, that are yeah. tr- sexually active are just trying to find that human connection. And if you have yeah. it verbally, then you might not need it as much sexually. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I still enjoy affection and kisses and, and mm-hmm. giggles and tickles. but um, And I still get aroused. But I, my libido is not in my face, you know, screaming, give me what I want. I'm not even really mm-hmm. fighting or resisting. It's just like, I feel great. I feel so fulfilled right now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, well, now we moved on to another subject. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I'm not quite like that. There's, there's a, there's a part of me that when, when, um, when we and Rachel are intimate, it's just like, I just want to, mm-hmm. I just want to basically just um, go in, go into that reality. I don't want to, I don't want to come out of that reality. I just want to be in that reality. Sure. Like, well, here, stop this. We'll wait till we'll, we'll just, you know, just take me there and just, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the thing. I, I think you do. You two really do enjoy that. I never experienced that with a guy. And, um, but I do experience it now. Mm-hmm. It's just in a different way. Mm-hmm. It's just, I had to shift my brain to figure out how to get that. And the lovely thing is that because it's not as temporary as sexual euphoria, Mm-hmm. Just the, the bliss and euphoria of being connected deeply with someone, it lasts. It just lasts and lasts. Mm-hmm. Well, see, I was sexually active, um, well, brought to me when I was about seven, eight years old. And a trauma mm-hmm. actually happened when I was about six in our household. And, you know, before Chris, all the relationships that I had were sexual. It was... Mm-hmm wham, bam, and where's the connection? And with me and Chris, we enjoy our time in the bedroom, and we have long sessions in the bedroom, but we already have that connection outside the bedroom, so we only have to zone in on the bedroom time. Not I connecting. totally believe you. Yeah, I, I think that makes perfect sense. And I think a lot of couples, a lot of straight couples at least, would acknowledge that the best part of their relationship is is just their being united, not necessarily the sexual orgasms, which they still enjoy, mm-hmm. but that they're united in so many ways. Mm-hmm. Well, see, like a, a friend of mine, a really good friend of mine, he, um, when when we were going out, we were hanging out back in the day. He was with one girl, um, being intimate with one girl, then being intimate with another girl, then being it. But then after after the intimacy, he was like you know, just basically throwing them away at the wayside. And I, it, it took me a few years to figure out, it's like, you're a hunter, you know, you're, you're kind of like a hunter, a fisherman, you know, you catch and release. And it's not the thing of yeah. being with somebody for you. It's, it's the thing of, you just want to get them, be intimate with them, then throw them away. You know, you, you, it's, you're, you're more in for the hunt. You're not in it for a relationship for, you know? Yeah. Well, sex feels good, and it's really easy to believe that that's the ultimate. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I think people who are in a mature relationship for a, a certain period of time find that, that there's a deeper union in something. It's not that they're going to throw sex away, but mm-hmm. that, that their union is the really fulfilling thing about it. 
And I have to be said, you know, I have to throw the girls under the bus, too. And men are not just mm, the only ones that are the hunters out there. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so there are definitely women out there that are hunting just as well. Oh, yeah. yeah. You got their phone numbers? No. <laughs> 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 Leave it me tomorrow packing your bags tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm kidding. Well, Carl, this has been an interesting conversation. Um, if somebody wants, do you got a website if somebody wants to find your books or whatever? Sure. Probably the easiest way to find my books is um, Google Carl Beckstrand, Carl with a K Beckstrand. I'm on Amazon and Walmart. Okay, and then Rachel will have that in the show notes. Show notes, yep. He will text it to me. I'll throw it in the show notes. Okay, and Carl, uh, thanks a lot for uh, calling. Uh, thanks a lot for being on the show. This was definitely interesting. <laughs> and like, yeah, thanks for having me. And like I said to people, yeah, this, uh, we're, you know, w- what I found out is that, you know, gay love and straight love, it's kind of one and the same, and kind of people are looking for the same thing. They're looking for that connection. They're looking for that person they care about. They're looking for that soulmate, and that and that's within both. And, you know, everybody needs love. Cause, Drop Carl Spurk. He'll give you some information. because yeah, trust me, there's... Uh, well, don't be surprised if it happens a different way than you expect. Yeah. Well, as John Lennon said to Brian Epstein, you know, there's enough hate in the world, you know, so... <laughs> And I'll let uh, Rage close us out. All right, you guys, we've come to an end. Um, I am appreciating all these listeners being patient with us. You know, you guys are enough all by yourself. But if you want to go find that one, find it in the healthiest way you can. Have a great one. Take it easy. Mm-hmm.